good morning, or good evening. My name is Michael Eaton, and it is my privilege to serve as Executive Director of National Model UN. I will be joined on screen by our Conference Secretary General, Alfie Jones, who will be coordinating this opening ceremony. As we begin, I offer thanks to our distinguished guests who will speak shortly. Gratitude to the Volunteer Secretariat, who over the course of the past year have prepared for various formats of the simulation, in person, hybrid, and now this all virtual National Model UN New York 2021. And deep appreciation for you, the participants from all over the world who recognize this activity as a commitment to further developing global citizenship. That you have maintained your enthusiasm even during a pandemic motivates our work. We at NAUN are all excited for this conference. And now, if everything is working as it's supposed to, I will introduce the first individual to officially welcome you to NAUN New York. New York. You will you recognize, recognize him on the screen. The screen. I do I ask, do ask everyone, if everyone can turn off their, their individual, individual cameras. cameras. It, will it will help make sure, sure that the broadcast is going out clearly to everyone. And now, United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Our world faces the biggest test since the Second World War. In these trying times, I welcome the holding of your model UN activity. Your commitment to international cooperation is essential for tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only defeat the coronavirus if we do so globally. We must come together and support the most vulnerable. The United Nations is undertaking a wide-ranging response calling for a global ceasefire and working to control the pandemic, save lives, mitigate the social economic damage, fight stigma and recover better. I draw great hope from seeing your generation mobilized to address the challenges of our time and to build a healthier, more equitable and sustainable future for all. I wish you a successful Model UN. Thank you, Secretary General Guterres. And so, distinguished delegates, faculty advisors, secretariat members, and honored guests, allow me to be now the second person to welcome you to the 2021 National Model United Nations New York Conference. I want to acknowledge that this is the first time our New York Conference will take place using a virtual format after having been canceled last year due to the pandemic travel ban. Only the second cancellation in a history that dates back to 1927 and the simulation of the League of Nations. Curious. It was a World War II travel ban that caused the only other time the simulation was not held. My own experience with the conference is long, but does not date back that far, though Alfie, our Secretary General, pointed out recently that he was born the year I first attended the conference as a delegate, as a student representing the United Kingdom, in fact. To Alfie's credit, however, he did point it out diplomatically. At that time, the conference had a shared computer lab where you waited in line to type up the clauses you've negotiated as a group by hand on legal pads with crossouts and additions, and in my case, poor penmanship. I don't think any of us at that time could have anticipated simultaneous edits on Google Docs, or even the possibility that we could connect remotely by video calls with peers from around the world. As I speak to you from North America, Alfie is joining in from Europe, and the session is being broadcast around the world including two amazingly dedicated students in Asia who are up in the middle of their night out of commitment to this type of experience. It's amazing, as are all of you from near and far. But I also want to acknowledge the inherent privilege of those of us participating. We at home or through our university have access to computers and adequate internet bandwidth that is not present everywhere, particularly in some parts of the developing world. I want to acknowledge, too, that there are voices missing in 2021, including students having recently contracted COVID-19. We look forward to having them back, and all of you, in 2022, when we plan to be back in person in New York City. But we carry on, because the world needs your ideas and your future leadership. Our conference last fall in D.C. proved to us that a virtual simulation really can work for NMUN including the informal negotiations needed to craft resolutions addressing current issues. And as I commented to one faculty advisor, since the UN itself is also meeting virtually, I suppose 
this format adds realism to the simulation. Let me conclude my welcome by wishing you well on behalf of the NMUN board, staff, and secretariat. We all look forward to the solutions you will propose in the coming days on the topics before your committees. And we hope that like many who have come before you, this conference might act as a catalyst to further define and promote an interest in you in a particular topic or area where you will continue to contribute into the future, be that in the public or private sector, and perhaps even as a diplomatist. I'll, I'll use that thought as a transition to my final task in this session. I have the pleasure of introducing someone who has been both a delegate here at NMUN and is now a diplomat at the United States Mission to the United Nations. As I give the floor to her to introduce her colleague, our keynote speaker, I'll also invite her to comment or perhaps shake her head yes or no if being a delegate at the actual United Nations is indeed similar to Model UN. It's a pleasure in any instance to welcome back to NMUN and alumna. The floor is yours, Carolyn Street. Thank you very much, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can certainly confirm that my four years participating in Model UN when I was in college were perhaps the best preparation for real negotiations at the United Nations, all the way down to arguing about individual words and individual clauses of resolutions. That, that is certainly something that, that we do and that those skills were invaluable to me um, in, in my current work. Um, so it is, it is my pleasure, uh, as Michael mentioned, to introduce your keynote speaker for this conference, Ambassador Jeff DeLaurentis. You can read more about his 28 years in the United States Foreign Service on his biography on the NMUN website. But for now, I will just note a few highlights from his remarkable career. Ambassador DeLaurentis joined the Foreign Service in 1991. An expert in Western Hemisphere affairs, he served multiple tours in Cuba before being called upon by President Obama to serve as the first chargé d'affaires at Embassy Havana following the reestablishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba in 2014. Ambassador De Laurentiis is also one of our foremost experts in multilateral diplomacy and someone who truly understands the ins and outs of the United Nations system. And if you've all done your homework, you understand how complex that actually is. He has held several positions at the US mission to the United Nations, including as ambassador and alternative representative for special political affairs, and now as part of the transition team for President Biden. I have personally had the honor to serve under Ambassador De Laurentiis at the US mission, both as an intern in 2012 and now. And I can tell you that for myself and for my colleagues, Ambassador De Laurentiis exemplifies everything that is the best about the US Foreign Service. Dedication, understanding of complex issues and dynamics, but above all, respect for everyone, be they an intern, a fellow ambassador, or a head of state. So with that, again, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ambassador De Laurentiis to all of you and to welcome him to the 2021 National Model United Nations. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you, Carolyn, for the generous uh, introduction. It's great to be with you all and speak about uh, the UN and multilateral diplomacy with participants from all across the globe, like the UN itself. I speak as a former American diplomat and maybe we'll exaggerate a little on American attitudes to make my points. And like many interventions at the UN, mine today will be somewhat political because I think the times call for it. I spent about half my diplomatic career at the US mission uh, to the UN in New York and Geneva, the last posting in New York as one of the American ambassadors. And I spent most of my time in the UN Security Council. I want to leave you with two messages today. The first is the importance, the necessity of multilateral diplomacy. The United Nations is not perfect, but you've heard this before, if it didn't exist, someone would have to invent it. 
I've seen firsthand what is possible when multiple nations come together to achieve a common goal. Now more than ever, the world is facing a host of challenges that show no regard for national borders and thus require a shared response. For starters, think coronavirus and climate change. As you will soon experience, diplomacy can be difficult and aggravating, but in the end, the world is more secure and the interests of the United States and other countries are best advanced when we act collectively. We can't address those challenges in isolation. We need the partnership of the global community. Our challenge in the United States is that not everybody agrees with this basic premise. It is a fact we must confront and deal with. I will come back to this. Uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, whom you just heard from, was recently quoted as saying, diplomacy to be effective requires personal contact. He was lamenting that the 75th anniversary of the UN last fall had to be celebrated virtually. And it is true that it is a challenge to conduct diplomacy in a virtual world. But his point is important. Diplomacy is all about personal contact and relationships and building trust, even with your adversaries. Even more important in a multilateral setting, because there are so many moving pieces or players, as the case may be, on the chessboard. For those Harry Potter fans, it's not quite wizard's chess where people kill each other, but an active spirited chessboard nonetheless. From my first days at the United Nations, one thing was very clear. Most governments send their best and brightest to the UN. Think about it. For many countries, the UN headquarters is a target of opportunity, a place where they can transact multilateral and bilateral business with other countries, especially true for smaller countries that do not have embassies in every capital around the world. If you are posted at the, to the UN, you can interact with the world in one place and you can build a worldwide network of colleagues you will meet again and again throughout your diplomatic careers. And those colleagues, those interlocutors, will become foreign ministers, prime ministers, and heads of state one day. I joined the American Foreign Service in 1991, ancient history I recognize. But it was a tipping point for multilateral diplomacy and the UN, at least in Washington. American attitudes toward the UN were beginning to shift. During my diplomatic training at the State Department, I was told that, that work at the United Nations was not career enhancing that bilateral postings, those at embassies in capitals were much more important where real work was done. Same was true if you were working at the State Department in Washington. We were told to align ourselves with a regional bureau rather than say the Bureau of UN Affairs, what we call international organization affairs. The important work, the work that got you noticed and promoted was in the regional bureaus. This began to change with the fall of the Berlin Wall, Security Council authorization of the US-led response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And within the Foreign Service, when US Ambassador to the UN Madeleine Albright became Secretary of State, my colleagues began to look at the UN and at a UN posting different, differently. In many ways, while not perfectly executed, the 1990s was the age of multilateralism. And we looked at the UN as it was meant to function, collectively addressing issues of peace and security, but had been blocked from doing so because of the Cold War. The Security Council moved from meeting twice a month to every single day, sometimes twice a day, authorizing and monitoring peacekeeping operations, and engaging in more and more disputes across the globe. In many ways, it was probably unfair to place so many demands on the organization without giving it time to prepare and the resources to adequately implement what the Security Council asked it to do. 
There were some successes, some colossal failures. Inaction on the Rwandan genocide comes to mind and overwrought and unmet expectations. And this uneven scorecard generated and has perpetuated the ongoing debate in the United States about the utility of an organization like the UN, a debate that, a debate that intensified during the Trump administration. So perhaps the first two lessons about working successfully as a diplomat at the UN or any other multilateral organization are number one, not only understanding, but having a solid command of your country's approach to this organization. What are your expectations, your goals and objectives? What do you expect to achieve from your interaction with the UN? And two, you need to know how the organization works, what it does, how it does it, its strengths, its weaknesses, what can be realistically achieved. If we compare the approach of the Trump administration to the Obama and previous US administrations to varying degrees, the differences are stark. President Obama told the General Assembly on September 24, 2014, quote, we see the future not as something out of our control, but as something we can shape for the better through concerted and collective action. President Trump told the UN General Assembly on September 25, 2018, quote, America is governed by Americans. We reject the ideology of globalism and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Last fall at the General Assembly, President Trump said, quote, if the United Nations is to be an effective organization, it must focus on the real problems of the world. This includes terrorism, the oppression of women, forced labor, drug trafficking, human and sex trafficking, religious persecution, and the ethnic cleansing of minorities, close quote. It was a selective list, leaving out stopping weapons of mass destruction, advancing sustainable development, climate change, the plight of refugees, other human rights issues, how to manage infectious diseases, among other issues. So as Americans, and for me trying to be objective, the question many continue to grapple now is, which approach, what strategy serves the US interest? The UN and other multilateral institutions have been an integral part of the international system since World War II, a system we had a significant hand in constructing. But many wonder if these institutions are furthering our collective interests. For me, the answer is clear. Human conflict and human problems can be ended by human courage. It's not my quote, but it resonates. Uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and articulated a worldview we should all embrace at her commencement address at Harvard in 2019. She spoke in German for most of the speech, except for the following, quote, tear down the walls of ignorance and narrow-mindedness for nothing has to say, stay as it is. If we step out into the open and have courage to embrace new beginnings, everything is possible. We must tackle the great problems we face together. We must find cooperative solutions that pay no heed to borders. We must think strategically rather than just practically. It is also my view that all countries, including the United States, should agree to be constrained by international law, including the UN Charter, because ultimately they, we, will benefit from doing so. And the UN remains uniquely positioned to address the critical transnational interests of the 21st century. The UN should be the place where every country comes to do business and solve problems that require collective action. Countries should use the UN to build coalitions around shared purposes. And if you are a diplomat at the UN, that makes you a frontline negotiator for some of the most critical issues we face. So my advice for anyone operating in this fascinating and difficult environment, I have six points. Some are mine, some from scholars, some from other practitioners. The first, it's not always about the big powers. 
The UN is a place where individuals, well-prepared, creative, curious, keen observers of their surroundings can make an enormous difference, no matter the size or influence of the countries they represent. People gravitate to leaders with integrity, interlocutors who inspire confidence and trust and keep their word. Second point, know your brief. You can't fake it, you have to master it. Number three, learn how to listen. I would like to think that I learned this skill in all my years at the UN, how to grasp a different perspective that was not just propaganda, how to place myself in the shoes of an interlocutor or adversary and figure out where the sweet spot is where interests converge, where both sides can leave the table with something valuable. Sometimes it is impossible or the timing is not right, but often it is, and you can learn how to spot the moment as well. And by the way, uh, this doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert or the life of a diplomatic cocktail party. I'm talking about the power of observation, about self-awareness, perceiving what is possible knowing your strengths and weaknesses, where you need help and when you don't. And let me say something about these cocktail parties everyone talks about at the UN, where critics claim diplomats spend too much time eating and drinking and not enough time working. You actually need to show up. One can get a lot of work done at these events because everyone is there and more relaxed than in a formal setting. One can have a sidebar conversation with an adversary, with someone you're obliged to treat differently in a formal meeting room at the UN. Fourth, know the rules of procedure, very critical. At the UN, they're different in each principal organ, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, they all have their own rules of procedure. And at the moment, we're operating under an unusual set of circumstances due to uh, COVID, which changes the way you have to strategize and navigate how to pursue your objectives. No matter the country, if you don't know the procedures, you can be easily outmaneuvered in a meeting. There are certain countries who train their diplomats to be multilateral diplomats only. Those are the ones you must watch out for because they know the procedures cold. And once you have mastered all that, fifth, watch out for the disease of hubris and arrogance. Some years ago, a young diplomat from a country I won't name, learned the rules of procedure extremely well and wanted to show off. He disrupted procedurally a meeting of the General Assembly Third Committee, which deals with human rights and humanitarian issues just to demonstrate that he could. And then he bragged about it. After that, he became the most unsuccessful diplomat at the UN and departed his posting early. Sixth and final point, get to know and treat with respect secretariat officials at the UN, the permanent staff, those running the meetings, the conference officers, the interpreters, the issue experts. Again, it's all about relationships. They can also help you learn your brief. Apart from being hardworking colleagues from all over the world with valuable experience and insight, they can be enormously helpful to any initiative you are running. They will know how to guide it through their bureaucracy. On a personal level, this is all common sense. Remember who and what you represent, show respect and humility, be curious, open, expect to be surprised, by how much more you may have in common with an interlocutor than you ever thought possible. It happened to me time and time again. Know yourself, develop your own moral compass and determine what you can defend and what you can't. No one is that good of an actor. People will see right through it. And at your own comfort level, speak up, take risks, but know when to do so. So, let me conclude with some good news, at least in my view, about where we are in the United States on this ongoing debate about the UN and whose views are gaining traction. You are fortunate 
to be learning about the United Nations, engaging in its practices, understanding its potential and importance at this very moment. We have an administration in the White House now, once again, strongly committed to multilateral diplomacy, to all that the United Nations stands for, and to address collectively the challenges of the 21st century I've been talking about. I was asked by the Biden-Harris administration to return to my old job as ambassador for special political affairs at the US mission to the UN for a few months to join the team repositioning the US to its rightful critical leadership role at the UN. So for a while anyway, I'm back in the thick of it. President Biden asked us to represent the United States at the United Nations by re-engaging with the world, restoring our alliances and partnerships, leading by example, and keeping American principles and the American people at the center of our foreign policy agenda. I continue to believe that the United Nations is the world's most important forum for bringing people and countries together. It doesn't mean it's perfect and could not be improved. Everyone deserves a UN that runs right and delivers responsibly with greater efficiency and effectiveness. But much of that responsibility falls at the doorsteps of the member states. This administration knows that when America is at the table and acting in accordance with our values, with universal values, the United Nations is an indispensable institution for the advancement of peace, security, and collective well being. The United States government now is committed to leading, not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. You have heard this sentence before. It's not just a slogan. It's a philosophy. Already, the Biden-Harris administration has put this vision into action. We would join the World Health Organization. We're providing up to $4 billion in funding for COVAX, the global initiative aimed at equitable distribution uh, of COVID-19 vaccines as a down payment on the work we need to do to stamp out the threat of COVID-19 worldwide. We were proud to rejoin the Paris Agreement and look forward to the climate summit the president plans to host for Earth Day. In keeping with the administration's commitment to gender equality, the United States sent a historically diverse delegation to the most recent session of the Commission on the Status of Women, led by Vice President Harris and ambassador, uh, our new ambassador to the UN, uh, Thomas Greenfield. We have restored financial and political support to the United Nations Population Fund and are endeavoring to pay our outstanding bills. And we have returned to engaging with the UN Human Rights Council, where we've announced our intention to seek election. These actions not only reflect our value as Americans, they advance the security and prosperity of Americans, as well as others around the world. So those of you who will represent the United States in the proceedings that are about to begin should keep this in mind. And those negotiating with members of the United States delegation should understand the kind of interlocutor you will be dealing with and the attitude of the government they represent. If you believe in the UN, how it is uniquely positioned to address the borderless challenge, challenges we have been talking about and the partnership of the global community it represents, your goal should be to help us, the United, the United States, sustain our reinvigorated approach to the UN. I wish you very good luck as the gavel comes down and your work begins. Thank you for listening. Ambassador De Laurentiis, thank you very much. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have you address our conference today. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce my friend and colleague, Deputy Secretary General Marlene Schreier. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. 10 years ago, I participated in my first NMU in New York conference as a delegate. 
Imagine a 21-year-old first-year college student being overwhelmed by the bustling streets and bright lights of New York City. Imagine crowded conference rooms with hundreds of students from all around the world huddling in their working groups. Also imagine the noise of 300 delegates in suspension just behind a razor thin paper mache wall while you try to deliver your first speech in front of another set of 300 delegates. Imagine huddling in working groups, writing your ideas and clauses on paper and finding a volunteer who would type it up and print it in the computer room. If you had a laptop back then, by default, you became the leader of the group. And today, we're all sitting in front of our laptops. And even though we cannot physically be together in New York, we are coming together in this virtual space created specifically for our conference to deliver our speeches to the delegates in our committee, to huddle in working groups and bring together our ideas. The secretariat are looking to you to come up with creative solutions and innovations for the problems of today. With our laptops in front of us, today we become all leaders. Regardless of if you have experience in leading, leading your student club, leading a project at school or at work, what I'm asking of you today and over the coming days is leading by example. Be inclusive of people and ideas. Be patient, especially when technology is making trouble. Help each other. Only together we can create NMU in New York 2021. And only together we can make it a participatory learning experience for all of us. Practice speaking, even if English is not your first language. And practice listening, even if you think you already have the perfect response in mind. We won't always succeed in negotiations with our peers. But we can always succeed in finding common ground and living diplomacy. Together, we can come up with better solutions to the challenges of our times than by ourselves. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that guide the United Nations today, they weren't created overnight and they weren't created by one person. So I'm glad to welcome so many of you today. I feel honored to serve as your Deputy Secretary General at our first fully virtual NMUN New York conference. As DSG, I am responsible for the substantive content of this conference, and I feel honored to be able to create and address such a great forum of driven young people who want to make the world a better place in so many different ways. And I'm excited to see the preparations of the past year unfold over the coming days. If you can be anything in the world, what would it be? I say, if you can be anything in the world, be kind to yourself and to others and work together towards tomorrow. Last but not least, feel free to take your laptop and sit on the carpet at home if you want to have the real enemy in New York hotel experience. And with that said, I invite Alfie Jones, Secretary General of NME in New York 2021, to share with us his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlene. Dear delegates, faculty advisors, guests and friends, I am honored to welcome you to the 2021 National Model United Nations, New York. In the coming days, Thousands of you from all over the world will gather together, perhaps not physically, but virtually at least. You will debate, cooperate, and draft and revise resolutions. Most importantly of all, you will learn to embody the spirit of diplomacy that, within the United Nations system, remains the best hope we have of solving humanity's most intractable problems. The last 12 months have been incredibly difficult for everyone all across the world. The pandemic presented great challenges for us at Enmon. Last year, the New, York the New York conference was canceled for the first time since 1945. 2021 is New York's first virtual conference. 
and I'm thrilled to be treading new ground with you all. Nothing can match the dynamism and possibilities of in-person human interaction, but I'm confident that the virtual space we've built this year comes quite close. I hope you've already had a chance to explore. It's been really exciting to see things in action at previous conferences, like NMUN DC, or during our volunteer staff training. Being able to buzz around, bouncing between different huddles of delegates, mirroring the way diplomacy works at our usual conferences, and indeed at the actual UN is fantastic. I would like to thank our conference secretariat, our incredible team of volunteer staffers. Without their tireless work throughout the year, I wouldn't have a conference to open today. They have written background guides, reviewed position papers, stress tested the hub, and shown great patience and flexibility as the conference leadership adjusted to world events. They have dedicated collectively thousands of hours to getting us ready. They are an inspiration to me, and I hope to you as well. Nearly a decade ago, I was attending Model United Nations as a delegate for the first time. I couldn't have imagined then that I would be here now addressing you as Secretary General of the Volunteer Secretariat. My own journey has been mentored by others who share our commitment to global citizenship, and I hope the events of the coming days will inspire that in you as well. Our theme for this year's conference is Together Towards Tomorrow. This theme reflects our shared desire for global and institutional renewal and a belief that by cooperating to find forward-thinking, inclusive answers to the questions we face, we can be ready for the challenges of the future. The UN itself is also looking to the future while tackling the crises of the president. General Assembly President Volkan Bozkir remarked that in 2021, there is only one New Year's resolution that has the power to change the course of history, and that is to work together to create a better world for all. Helpfully for our conference theme, the UN has named its public advocacy campaign pushing for global access to COVID-19 vaccines only together. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said a few weeks ago that no country can overcome this crisis in isolation. Only together can we protect the world's most vulnerable people. Only together can we revive our economies. And then together, get back to the things we love. I encourage you to think about this theme as you approach the conference. What does coming together mean for us in a year when we cannot physically do that? How do we shape and move towards the future we want to build? In what ways must we cooperate to achieve the change we want to see? Can you harness the power of existing institutions or of emerging technology to transform the world around you? Ask difficult questions in the next few days of each other, of your faculty advisors, your committee directors, and most importantly, of yourselves. Challenge the assumptions you have about yourself and the world around you. Your research and writing in preparation for this conference has been exemplary. I encourage you to come together now and carry this focused mindset into the next few days. Good luck as we travel together towards tomorrow. I am delighted to declare the 2021 National Model United Nations Conference open.